Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Clements from the Leesburg Public Library. To start off, I wanna thank Tom Wilcox for providing this insightful program commemorating the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Tom is a career reference librarian who has worked here for many years before retiring. I also wanna thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring this program. Tom also has another program coming up on December 16th. It's the White House Christmas. And like I said before, it's a very well-known <laughs> beloved program here. So without further ado, I will let Tom take over. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Well, it's good to see everyone. And uh, it, I'm wearing my Aloha shirt and my Mahalo B shells necklace, but this really is a rather serious thing. And it was brought to me most strongly in August because I was actually there at the Arizona Memorial and it really, really brings it very much home to you. So basically, we're going to sort of cover the immediate period on the attack, what was happening before, what happened during, and what happened immediately thereafter. So here we go. Said, well, it actually economically, it was a fairly good time in 1941, more people were back at work, uh, living became a lot easier and this is just a brief snapshot of where the US was at that time. And this is a marvelous picture. This is actually taken in New York's Chinatown. It's their 1941 holiday parade. And one of the things you can see is this monolith above their heads was the Third Avenue elevated train line, which is now gone. But uh, that's, but Chinatown is still in the same location. And uh, Americans worked a lot harder in some ways than we do now because it was now it's mostly clerical, uh, whereas then it was really mostly agricultural, industrial, but there were some white collar. These are some school teachers in a, a school. And this is some of the things they did for fun. They rooted for sports. This is Joe DiMaggio, uh, known as Jolton Joe or the Yankee Clipper. <laughs> and uh, this is their 1941 football annual. And this is a big deal. They said they have 600 pictures in it. So people were really, really into things like that. And they went to the movies and I chose these two simply because Buck Privates, which was a service comedy made after we instituted a peacetime draft. And the joke is, is that Abbott and Costello are doing all sorts of crazy things, sort of fish out of water type story. But some of the people involved were the Andrews sisters who were, who sang a couple of numbers, including the famous Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy of Company B. And Patty Andrews, many years later, I actually saw this, that's how I remember it. She was on the Dick Cavett show and she was told by Universal who made the film that this was their highest grossing film until Jaws. <laughs> and this one, How Green Was My Valley, this is the famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, of a film that beat out Orson Welles uh, film, Citizen Kane for the best film of 1941. And uh, that was also extremely successful. And they liked reading. In fact, I think people generally read more then than they do now, but uh, hopefully a lot of people are reading on their devices and everything and people are still reading. But uh, all of these were the most successful bestsellers of 1941 and by 1945, all three of them had been made into films. And they also listened to big bands and they were very popular. These are just two, Benny Goodman and the Miller bands. And actually overall, all these years later, I think you're, you still hear a lot of Glenn Miller and his band is actually still in existence. And uh, that's really sort of cool. But as you see with the microphone, many of these bands broadcast directly from theaters and ballrooms and uh, young people throughout the whole nation would listen and form dance parties and everything at home. 
Uh, however, there was a darker side to it too, because these shows like today were sponsored by people trying to sell products and the cigarette companies uh, actually sort of detailed these programs and supported them because they wanted to catch young people who were getting to the age where they would start to smoke. And uh, Goodman's program was known as the Camel Caravan. So not very much subtlety there. And of course, you know, they listened to the radio, which was extremely popular because first of all, you didn't have to go out, you didn't have to pay money, take a streetcar or a taxi. It was right there in your home. And the 29 million radios by 1941 was a substantial increase because in 1930 in the census, they actually asked Americans who, if they owned a radio and out of something like 123 million people, only 12 million of them, including my great grandfather, owned a radio set. So this was a, a huge jump considering the depression. In fact, actually some electric companies would give you a radio if you got the electricity installed into your home. And this is a, a period thing. Radio entertainers vote Jello program favorite Bob Hope top comedian in fifth annual poll. And this is a cover story detailing one of the most popular programs on the air. And you might know the name because Blondie is still in the, you know, comics. You still see them. But with uh, Arthur Lake here shouting, the reason why they did this was that, of course, you know, people would turn the dial to see what was on one of the other networks and they wanted to keep you there. So the announcer would say very playfully, uh, uh, oh, don't touch that dial. It's time for, and Arthur Lake would scream, Blondie! And on this side was the Blondie herself, Penny Singleton. And, uh, most of you know her voice from cartoon reruns of the Jetsons because she created the voice of Jane Jetson. Now we're getting to why this is an advertising spread for on Waikiki Beach, here's Diamond Head. And it's, I mean, having just been there, it's really wild to see how empty it was. <laughs> just this little outrigger canoe and this young woman posing. And uh, this was someone like Hawaiian royalty. This was Duke Kamehameha. He was a champion uh, surfer and also an Olympic swimmer. And he participated in very many surfing contests. And it took real effort there because the days of hollow fiberglass surfboards were still in the future. These surfboards were made of wood. And uh, he is so revered in Hawaii that in Waikiki Beach, you can actually see a statue of him. And uh, they were doing all sorts of things. Like I said, this was a real dream military posting. And this is Dorothy Lemoore uh, cavorting with soldiers on Waikiki Beach for Army Day. And uh, little did they know. <laughs> But here we go, you know, despite what it looked like in peacetime America, it really was starting to go south. And this is one example of that. When New York City tore down the Sixth Avenue elevated uh, rail line, Japan was a reported buyer for several miles worth of scrap steel. And this is a rumor that you still actually hear about on the internet. It still comes up in various different pages on like Facebook and other places. And it was so pervasive that uh, the Manhattan Borough president in 1946 actually launched an official investigation and they really couldn't conclude that Japan had actually purchased any of the steel and uh, in fact, it says here, a large portion was bought by two men, one from San Francisco and one from the Bronx who paid 80 grand for 20,000 tons of steel. 
But another thing to consider is that a great deal of this railway being built in the 19th century, the metal of choice was still iron. And uh, a lot of this was actually iron, but there was no real proof that the Japanese got it, but they did actually make steel purchases in the United States because the State Department actually banned selling steel to them. And that actually would have great ramifications a lot later. And just to give you an idea how tense things were going, the main branch of the library system I worked in in New York, the Brooklyn Public Library System opened in March of 1941. And when I worked there, there were these empty tunnels so vast that they spread underneath the main building, underneath Flatbush Avenue and underneath Prospect Park across the street. And uh, the old time timers, when I was there, I was there in the eighties, they told me that the reason why they were there is that civilian defense requested bomb shelters. And they were only a mile away from the Brooklyn Navy Yard and it was just deemed necessary. And even though we weren't at war, they were built <laughs> all the same. And with Europe at war, the prime way to get back and forth was still by ocean liner because uh, Pan Am didn't start the flights to Europe until after the war in 1946. And uh, as you see, this is the United States lines and this is the, the, the ship, the America. And it gives the name of the line and shows two large American flags. And this was not casual identification because they wanted them Nazi wolf packs, their submarines to know this ship belonged to a neutral nation. And uh, I have to say, this was one of my childhood toys because uh, my father worked for the company and my sister and I were all over this ship and its later sister ship, the United States. It was just incredible. These are the largest things ever built by mankind that actually move. And just to show you how bad things were getting, the US began its first peacetime draft in 1940, and this is very politically unpopular, but somehow, uh, despite a strong isolationist uh, message in Congress and amongst the public, it managed to pass. And this, a lot of people, these men are this, uh, being inducted. And even private industry dealing with uh, started getting into things about the war, even though we weren't at war, said so keep the planes in the air. I mean, the mantra was defense. We need the planes for defense. So we're the lifelines of national defense. This is from Western Electric. And even though there was no war yet, we were actually actively selling things to our European allies in France and Great Britain. And uh, I mean, Americans are extremely polarized on the war. And this is a cartoon by someone, uh, millions of American school children uh, know. This was drawn by Dr. Seuss. This was earlier in his career. And it shows an Uncle Sam, what a lucky thing we've got separate beds and on the other side is Europe, Hitleritis, Blitzpock, fascist fever. And this picture is the exact ext different extremity. Um, this was an ad for bundles for Britain and Cecil Beaton, the society photographer of his period, actually took this picture and she was, a bomb survivor. They dug her out of the rubble and she's here with her doll. <laughs> now, nobody was really thinking as much about Japan. The whole thing about America participation was in a European war, but some people were noticing and President Roosevelt actually requested the Pacific fleet 
to go from Los Angeles to Hawaii as a Czech. And of course the Japanese saw it as a threat, but they also saw it as an opportunity because they actually had nine aircraft carriers and we had seven and we divided them between two oceans, which they didn't have to do. And uh, now we also tried active negotiation and these are the ambassadors, uh, Admiral uh, Nomura and Special Envoy Caruso. They actually were meeting with President Roosevelt at the White House on November 27, 1941. And by that time, the attack fleet was already at sea. Now, I should say that uh, neither of these men knew what their government was doing. They were not informed until uh, December 5th, Friday, December 5th. And this is sort of an interesting story because the Japanese records indicate that they were supposed to give us at Pearl 30 minutes warning of the attack, but which never happened. And uh, this is uh, William Manchester in The Glory and the Dream, which is a very interesting book about this period said that one of the things Tokyo misunderstood was how things were run on Fridays in official Washington because all the clerical staff would uh, knock off at 3 p.m. So there were no translators, no stenographers, no anything available to interpret this radio message, the cable message from uh, Japan. So the envoys themselves and their small staffs had to piece it all together. Now, one thing that gives veracity to this story is that on December 7, when they spoke to uh, Secretary of State Hull, they were officially recorded as being some 40 minutes late, which never happened in diplomacy. So there was obviously a reason why this did. But a lot of people still believe something was going to happen. This is from the Hilo Tribune for November 30th, 1941. I mean, that's quite an alarming uh, headline, but that's what they believed. And I like this one down here, steps taken to end dock delays here. Boy, does that sound familiar to 2021. And this is a US Navy photograph I wanted to put this in, this was just a little bit before the attack, October 30th. And I wanted this because this is Ford Island. This is Battleship Row right here. These are other auxiliary ships. And the thing to remember, and this got to be very important is that this channel is the only way to get out to open sea. So in a way, Pearl Harbor is not the best place to put a fleet. And uh, December 7th started very peacefully. This is uh, the Iolani Palace, which you can still go and see. And it is the only royal residence in the borders of the United States of America. And uh, when we were there, I was trying to sort of figure out which side of the building, because both sides, this side and the other side have the same facade. And I concluded that this spot you're looking at now is actually where the present state house for Hawaii is. And it's actually in direct counterpoint to this because as this was built in the Western style, their uh, new state house built when they became a state in the 60s was to supposedly resemble more native architecture and it's actually built to resemble an actual erupting volcano with an open amphitheater and, and large sheets of metal sort of pointing out at the sky like it was lava and they actually have lava rock walls and everything is quite remarkable but uh, it was a very quiet day in Honolulu but not for long and I mean people did not understand at all what was happening. Uh, one nurse I saw in a documentary, she said one of the Japanese pilots actually flew between the wings of 
the military hospital and the pilot was so close, he actually held up his hand to wave and she involuntarily waved back because she didn't realize what it was. A lot of people thought these were actual American planes. And, uh, but we quickly found out <laughs> that it wasn't. And these are uh, photographs actually taken by the Japanese uh, from, from their planes. So this is uh, going down to Battleship Row and these are after the torpedo uh, pedo planes. The, and this is all four of these ships. Actually only one of them was totaled and that was the USS Oklahoma. And this is the Arizona and the Oklahoma. And this is a rather rare shot because very few of the footage from that time was taken in color. And the Oklahoma was totally tipped over on its side and a lot of men died in it because since they had a double hull, they couldn't weld through the hull to make holes to get them out. And this was actually a telegram. It was sent, said all US Navy ships present Hawaiian area. And it said air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. And a lot of people thought at home that this was something like a War of the Worlds type broadcast that it was just a show, but no, this wasn't. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't just the military who suffered. This is actually a, a Japanese zero that crashed near a school in the Honolulu area. And these three civilians were killed in this car. And the caption says they were eight miles away from a military target. And uh, this is gonna be interesting. I actually found on the internet archive, they had uh, actually a page dedicated to all the available programming that was happening that day. And uh, this is, Let's see if we can try and get into this because you'll like this. So there's not a lot of uh, things available from that time. I hope everybody could hear that, but it, 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 I thought that was fantastic. And of course, back home, the news came Eastern Standard Time about 2 p.m. Most people had finished lunch. Uh, they were listening to the radio. Mostly there was a lot of football going on that day. And uh, this is... Basically, it was a big shock. I mean, some people didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. <laughs> Another thing that happened was that there's actually about two minutes of live on the scene reporting from a Honolulu station. And there's only two, about two minutes because the operator broke in 
while the announcer's standing on the roof of his broadcasting studio describing everything and said that uh, she had to, they had to make an emergency call. And even though he protested and said that we were talking to New York, she pulled the plug and he was off the air. But uh, so immediately the next day, President Roosevelt requested Congress to declare war, which they did. He's signing it. Um, this armband is because his mother had recently died, and so he's still in mourning. But this was actually a December 7th uh, headline to Providence Sunday Journal in Rhode Island. And this is the news that they knew of at the time. And actually, radio was sort of caught flat-footed uh, by this. Uh, this was long before the age of 24-hour news and places you can take a plane to. In a, uh, We got there in about 13 hours uh, from here, and uh, that was just not possible then. Uh, you had to take a train, which is about four days, to the coast in Los Angeles, and then you had to get to a Matson liner to, to take you the other 1,100 miles. So uh, the news is very scarce and actually most of the programming you can actually find on YouTube and everything to this day are mostly regular programming. Uh, New York Philharmonic, uh, Sammy Kay, a popular band playing and they would just break in giving whatever news they actually had at that particular moment. And and this is basically American reactions. They're here waiting for news, seeing uh, the headlines. The next day, men starts, uh, whoever wasn't drafted, they start signing up. And uh, uh, Pearl Harbor had, you know, something like 2,300 casualties, most of them on the Arizona. And uh, it is still an active military cemetery. In fact, actually, just to show you how strict they are, when we were there, you cannot use your phone, except you cannot receive or make a call from the memorial. You can use it to take photographs, but that's the only permissible use. And this is sort of a, a local thing, believe it or not, because I actually knew some of these men. Uh, they, our neighborhood in, in Bay Ridge, uh, Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn, was close enough to the Navy Yard that you could live there and commute. And uh, these are men, ship workers, who volunteered to be sent to Pearl Harbor for an indefinite period to try and rebuild and actually the reason why they were useful was that uh, the Japanese planned three attacks and only two of them were carried out because they did not know the location of our aircraft carriers and they decided not to take the chance. And actually that was our salvation because um, the oil tanks were spared the ship, uh, the dry docks, the machine shops were spared. I mean, it would have been pretty bad if they had been able to come back. But uh, anyway, when they recruited them, they decided to let them spend one last Christmas with their families and they uh, left in uh, January of 1942. And this was the speech they made. Uh, Admiral Morquard, Commandant of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, said that you were doing as much as men who are rushing to recruiting stations. And uh, this is a very sensitive time because, I mean, this is a poster. I mean, people were really, really upset, extremely upset, and uh, said our bullets will do it. And this was an extraordinary one, I mean, we didn't have to have social media to have extremely strange rumors going about. And I find it incredible that the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is like the New York Times, LA Times, 
uh, a paper of record actually had this headline. So they obviously believed it, but uh, nobody knew what was going on. And this, these are pictures of New York going into dim out or black out. And in this picture in Times Square, uh, upper floors were urged to cover or keep lights out entirely. Lower places were told that they could still be okay from the street, but they had to like dim all their window lights. And as you see, it was starting to get very, very effective very quickly. But I mean, people were getting very panicky. Uh, and I like this, Venus gave police headquarters a telephone operators a headache uh, Thursday. Uh, said alert citizens telephone in to report a flare over the municipal airport and uh, said, it looks like it's about 10,000 feet up, one man volunteered. His estimate was short by many millions of miles because it was Venus. And this is something you saw in a lot of public buildings. You know, don't rush into the streets, stay where you are, you know, keep cool. And Americans were just going into it. And this is something you found in a lot of schools all of a sudden, what they should do in an air raid, because we know how terrifying that is to have a crisis like that. And you're at work or at home and your kid is in school. And this is a picture of New Orleans with rationing and sugar was the first one to be rationed as early as uh, February, 1942. It was also the last one to leave that it was in March of 1947 that the <laughs> full sugar rationing ended and blackout fines. They really wanted you to observe it. And uh, this is how much a hundred dollar fine would be. It would be over $1,600 today. So it was quite stiff. And uh, I actually have a funny cartoon that ran in the New York in that period. It shows a woman talking out of her, her window to a stern air raid warden with a helmet on. And the caption says, my light is not showing and get off my tulips. But unfortunately, there was a big casualty in all this as Americans were coming together and marshalling their efforts to fight this war that they didn't want and weren't actually expecting. Um, suspicion began to fall on Japanese Americans because while in this family, all of these children were probably born in the United States, but their parents probably were not. And uh, the FBI began to register them, check their homes. And there was so much hysteria to do something that uh, it was getting very, very hard to ignore the issue. And these are actually government po uh, posters. This is your, you know, <laughs> your parents, grandparents, tax dollars in action. And see, there's a little symbol there, you know, this US government. And uh, I mean, just to show you the depth of emotion at that time, I had a good friend, she was a teenager at the time, she said her mother smashed every single piece of her prized Japanese china. I mean, she just was that angry. And I mean, they, tr they tried this grocery had a big sign, I am an American. And uh, it just wasn't doing any good. And finally, this is what uh, Executive Order 9066, and of course we remember from fairly recent times that a lot of executive orders went out. Well, this was probably one of the most momentum ones and it allowed the army to round up all persons of Japanese extraction and uh, our ancestry and uh, they moved them to interior internment camp camps. And if you go on websites like California, Colorado, Idaho, all of these states had these very, very large, rather 
bare camps. They were just like tar paper and wood dormitories and cafeterias and all sorts of things. And these people had to live there for three years. Uh, in fact, one of them is uh, George Takai of uh, Sulu Star Trek fame. He, as a child, he was interned. And, uh, but the worst part was over. And uh, basically this is uh, Jimmy Doolittle's plane taking off from the US Hornet to bomb the Japanese homeland. And uh, it almost didn't happen because they were spotted by a Japanese ship several hundred miles away from where they were planning to be because it was supposed to be a night raid and they would land into a Chinese held China in the daytime. Instead, it was totally opposite. <laughs> they loaded as much extra gas as they could. They took off during the day, uh, bombed Japan during the day and had to try and land at night and many of them crashed because it was dark unfamiliar terrain on the coast. In fact, actually, many critics consider 30 seconds over Tokyo to be one of the best World War II movies ever done. So I totally recommend it. But this was a big shock to the Japanese. They were told by their leaders that that wouldn't happen. And even though the damage was fairly negligible, in fact, today it's often called a PR <laughs> bombing campaign because it didn't do a hell of a lot of damage, but it did do some. And basically from May of 1942, the Japanese would be fighting a defensive war. Midway was especially uh, important because we destroyed four of their carriers in one day's battle. And this was uh, something that they ultimately could not win. But uh, there was still a lot of issues involved because like for instance, Japanese Americans were actually, the Japanese Americans were allowed to work for the war effort. Every camp had a Boy Scout <laughs> troop. They, uh, you know, raised the American flag and, and all that stuff. Uh, and they did this normal uh, American style life uh, as much as they could. And eventually it, it, it paid off because they allowed uh, young men of uh, Japanese ancestry who were born in America to fight in the European theater of war. Uh, and uh, they are uh, the 442nd, they call their motto's go for broke. They, these guys had something really to prove. And what they did is that they turned out to be the most decorated unit in US military history. And in closing, these are the ruins of the Arizona. This was taken December 12th, 1941. This is a US Navy photograph. And what they did was uh, they removed all of this and actually the only thing you actually see sticking above surface now is gun turret number two and it's all underwater and in the 60s they built the uh, memorial over which is all stark white and when you go there uh, boats leave about every 15 minutes you have about 15 minutes to stay and on one wall they have the names of everyone who actually died on the Arizona. And uh, believe it or not, I actually found one name with my name. I don't know, they, I don't think they were a relative, but it, it, it was a little eerie seeing that. And uh, I recommend going there. It, it, it's really quite an experience. So I hope you enjoyed this very quick go over of the, what was happening in Pearl Harbor. And uh, if you can ever get there, you should definitely see this memorial. And they have a very good museum uh, before you actually get to the uh, boat going to the memorial. Uh, one of the things they had that I took a picture of was they, in the 1990s, they dredged 
a Japanese torpedo that didn't explode and it was in the mud of the harbor all those years and it was still active. <laughs> so if you, if you ever get there, definitely check that out. And you, it's very easy to get there, believe it or not, because we actually took the bus from Waikiki. They have an unparalleled bus system on Oahu and uh, it takes about an hour, but you can definitely get there and save all your Uber or Lyft dollars. And in closing, I hope you enjoyed the program and I wish you the very best for this holiday season.